If you're here for storytelling, try to move a little bit closer. You don't have to be right in the front, but uh, it'd be nice if I could see you and at least have at least one other person at your table because this is a workshop and it is not uh, you know, just me performing for you. It is a workshop. And as a result, you need to prepare yourself to work, right? Because we're here to learn about storytelling. If you're not part of this session, please go to where you need to be because they're waiting for you desperately. Uh, make sure you have paper and something with which to write. Uh, and I prefer it not be electronic because in the creative process, at the act of handwriting actually helps to release creativity in the brain. Uh, and this is what people in marketing know and people in PR, when they, in advertising agencies, they always start with a piece of paper. And at home, in my own creative process, I have very large pieces of paper that I work on. So just the act of physically writing helps to crack into your creativity. Uh, I would like you to first, at this moment, introduce yourselves to the people that are around you at your table. Just say um, for a moment, your name, where you're from, and why you're in this workshop. Take about two minutes to do that. All right, you have 30 seconds. So on a piece of paper with a pen or a pencil, crayon, whatever you've got, I'd like you to spend a minute just reflecting on the prompt, what do you hope to get out of this workshop and what questions do you have? And Alyssa, I'm gonna to have to ask you to run around with the mic in a moment uh, because I'm gonna ask people to share their questions. But take about a minute uh, to answer the prompt. What do you hope to get out of the workshop? What questions do you have? You can write out your answers, you could draw a picture if you like, or just make a list. All right, so I'm curious to hear what you hope to get out of this workshop to see how, how deeply I'll disappoint you. 
uh, and to also see what questions you have up front. I may not answer the questions, but it will help me know kind of what you're looking for and if it's already in the workshop or if I could work it out. So if we've got someone with a mic who can run around, you could say it loud, but I wanna make sure we get it because we are live streamed. Hi everyone who is on the live stream, wave to them. I think the camera's over there. Uh, live stream folks, we're gonna be doing some different prompts at times. If you don't have people to do this with, that's fine. You might have imaginary friends or you can just you know, do it on your own. But we, I'll try to shout out to you every now and then too because I know that you're there all the thousands of people who are watching us live right now. So, okay, so who would like to share uh, in the room um, why you are here? And we've got a mic there. Yeah. So, and what's your name? Ding. Songwriter who wants to see how to incorporate some of these stories and ideas into songs and into shows. That's really awesome. We've got a question over here. Do we yet have a working mic? Yeah, we've got it. Woohoo! Just how to use storytelling to get urgency across without shutting people down. Ah, yes. Because climate change is such a buzzkill, right? You're at a party, what do you do? I do climate change. <laughs> climate change induced zombie syndrome. They just kind of like. A way to inspire all of us to dig into our collective better selves to build a new story for life on planet Earth. Uh, a way to visualize positive outcomes and futures through storytelling. I love those verbs, inspire and visualize, and that's what good stories can do, where you experience it, you see it. Uh, three things, how to tell better stories, how to tell stories that grab attention and cut through party affiliation, and how to connect with people heart to heart. Ooh, yeah, that's what, that's what good stories do, yeah, and we're gonna definitely look at that today. Uh, Yes, I'm here to have fun, and my question is, I can't think of any questions right now. What's wrong with me? <laughs> well, knowing you as I do, um, we can have a private session about that, and I, I'll, I'll do a TikTok about it, too. <laughs> Good to see you, Brian. He's a climate comedian, and that's important, because climate change is hysterical. <laughs> it makes people hysterical. All right, Mike Person, you? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. um, I think for me, I, I did a few blog posts and I found that when I talked about my experience with climate, some friends would activate and they'd go out and you know get an EV or do solar or whatever they whatever it was. And so that's really powerful. And then I, the, I, I often face the zombie climate party syndrome you mentioned where it's like, okay, how do you talk to everyone else who's not, who's gonna fall into depression or anxiety instead of seeing the path to action? So looking for relatability there. It's a good question because the emotional needs of our listeners are as important as their intellectual needs. They need the information, but if emotionally they can't hear it, it doesn't matter how good your story is and what you're telling them. So I had a couple of fundamental questions. Is what actually makes a good story? Ooh. What are the elements? Uh, is there related how, what makes a story engaging and does it have to be personal or could it? be about somebody else and be just as effective. You're like a plant. This is exactly what we're gonna talk about at some point. I'm not only looking for new ideas and new approaches, but I'm the media person for our chapter. I've been very successful in getting a lot of letters to the editor and guest opinion columns published. However, I never am published in our conservative newspaper, mm. only the progressive one. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in how I might tweak my writings to be more appealing to the editors of the conservative newspaper. Very good, yeah, and I'm gonna tell a story that uh, ran in my local very conservative district paper, uh, and there are ways, in fact, one of the, you may walk away with a story that you can use as a letter to an editor. Like these stories will have multiple uses and that's one of them. Okay. 
Um, so I'm looking to to learn how to tell an effective story that can catch the attention for younger people, especially through like social media, and tell stories that can maybe motivate and inspire. Yeah, and, and I, I like that you're thinking about social media because this is where a lot of these stories go, and which means they have to be short, which is one of the things that we're gonna talk about. How do you get to the essence of that story and make it so compelling they're like, I need to listen to the end so they don't swipe past you? Um, I think that telling stories can be a very vulnerable act, so how do you help people with get past that wall of, in, of being vulnerable? That, that's a great question that I want to answer right now about being vulnerable. We carry so many stories inside of us, and some of them are incredibly personal, and they're not meant for the public. You don't have to tell every part of your story. And um, what's powerful about sharing a vulnerable story, it, it invites vulnerability. When you're vulnerable, people then will be vulnerable with you. So for instance, uh, I'm gay and I was on a plane once some years ago and I sat next to, unbeknownst to me, the, the head of counseling at an organization called Focus on the Family, which at the time, if you don't know, it was the biggest anti-gay organization uh, on the planet. And, and I was like, how did I get seated behind, in the middle of this couple, I was in the middle of this couple. And they're like asking me, she's asking me like, so what do you do? Da, da, da. So I decided not to get defensive and just show her my soft underbelly instead of the like, Rrr. and just kind of talk to her about the many years I struggled with being gay and Christian and kind of just show that to her. And then she revealed something about herself, about a, a, a son of hers who had married a woman who came out later as lesbian. She shared something with me. And then she said, Ken, you need to talk to this young man. Which you say young man, you're like, yeah, that's me, I'm a young man. <laughs> wow. And I, again, told him my story. And then he turned to me and he said, um, I had a, a nephew who came to me and said, um, I have AIDS and I'm afraid to tell my parents. Would you tell them? And I said, well, you obviously are an extraordinary person that he would trust you with that story. And that vulnerability just opened up and we retained a friendship for years until they passed away and they became actually great helpers at Christian colleges where they were on the boards to make things easier for the gay, lesbian, bi, transgender students there. And so choosing the right time to be vulnerable, you never quite know. And it is, you're giving something of yourself away and you don't wanna cast your pearls before swine as the saying goes but it also has a power. But don't ever feel like you have to. If it feels too uncomfortable, don't share that very personal story. Go to a different place. Thank you for that question. It's an important one. Hi, I'm interested in short stories, in particular developing an elevator speech aimed at climate, climate change doubters who engage them in a longer conversation. You should, be go, you should go on TikTok and start creating content for TikTok. It's like a minute you got to tell that story or less. And they, they, you basically have three seconds before they swipe. It's like the Tinder of social media. They're like, mm, no, no. It would be a great place to kind of practice that. So I'm gonna take two more questions from two gentlemen who had their hands up for a bit, and then we're gonna switch over to live stream questions because we've got a couple. Oh, dear. Okay, and then we need to get moving because yeah. we got stuff to do. Thank you. So my question is, how can we best mobilize stories to unlock the caring about our one precious planet that I believe is buried inside most of us? I, uh, a quick answer to that question is don't push it. Stories are kind of like wild horses. They have their own direction they wanna go. And if you're pushing too hard to make a story like that, chances are you're not gonna land on it. Instead, you need to be open and recognize there are lots of stories to tell about climate change for different reasons. And as you open yourself up to developing different types of stories, you'll figure out, ah, this is a good story for this. This is a good story for other climate advocates because it will inspire them and encourage them. This is a good story to tell myself to keep going. So part of it, don't push it. If you push the story, I want the story to do this, it will misbehave and will fail you. 
So I guess I had a question, and I think you answered it a little bit with your explanation about vulnerability, but you know, how do we get other people to tell their own story and how that might engage, you know, for if they're unengaged in climate change right now, that perhaps they've got a story that they can tell that might light up, you know, turn on the lights for them on how this issue is important to them. A, a quick answer is that stop telling climate stories, right? Because there's a type of story about the climate that often is about the environment, some wild wilderness space, and it doesn't track with everyone. Uh, so one of the things you're gonna learn from this session is how to tell a story that doesn't seem to have anything to do with climate change, but people will connect because they recognize that story. And that's when people open up, when, they, when you kind of tell a bit of their story in telling your own. Uh, so it's a very good question because I think that's where we failed in many times was we've been telling climate stories and they haven't worked the way we wanted them to. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we have some online questions. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, so this one comes from Amir and they ask also, how can I connect with people who have very different opinions when it comes to climate change to make sure they can relate to my story when it comes to protecting the planet for my son when they may not even think it's that important for them? Yeah, people care about lots of different things. And for one, they don't have to stop caring about that thing to also care about climate change. Uh, in fact, I think it's a mistake if, if, if we're expecting people to drop what they're doing and join CCL, because they may be doing something really important that already is a climate issue, they just may not see it. So for instance, if they care about pets and emergency pet shelters, that's a climate issue. If they care, care about policing and reforming the police, that's a climate issue, especially when you've got a state of emergency in a city. Um, policing is a very important thing to make sure it, there's some real thought behind that. Uh, if, if you care about like homelessness, domestic violence, all of these things, have a connection to climate change. So one thing is be curious about what they already care about, affirm that and say, wow, that's awesome because that can be connected to climate change. And the second thing is we, while we may not share the same issues, we often share the same values. And I've definitely found this in working um, on a lot of LGBTQ stuff and religious stuff. I speak with lots of conservatives and we are on different sides of the issues but we all both care about caring for our families. I mean, that is a big thing. And for me, my family are, you know, is, extends beyond my, my family family, but other LGBTQ people, particularly young people. And so there are some values that we share that we can say, yeah, we both believe in those things, even though we see it differently. So talking about your values is a very important thing. Uh, and that'll come up a little bit in our workshop today. That was it. That was it, great. So um, I've asked you a lot of questions and you may know nothing, very little about me. I'm Peterson Toscano. Uh, this is my 10th year being in CCL. I was at that 2013 conference where Marshall Saunders spoke with my husband, Glenn, who dragged me into this, kicking and screaming. I was like, it sounds kind of boring. Uh, because I'm a performance artist by nature and I was trained in uh, English literature and I'm a Bible scholar. So I was like, what does this geeky, wonky, DC thingy have to do with me? Uh, I need to find my response to climate change. And I found that there were creative responses, but then also working on legislation, for me, I realized was really meaningful because you get a lot of bang for the buck, right? You change a law and then that changes society. So I realized that part of my climate portfolio was very much being a volunteer lobbyist. He, I became the lead of our meeting of, of our chapter. I'm now the liaison for that chapter. And I'm the host of Citizens Climate Radio. How many of you have ever listened to an episode of Citizens Climate Radio? What's wrong with the rest of you? CCL since 2016 has had a monthly podcast that I host and now I have co-host with me, Ruth Abraham, who you're gonna see here at the conference. Are you in the room? Ho! Oh, there's Ruth, yeah, give her a big round of applause. She has, this month she is hosting with Lila Powell um, without my, uh, my presence, uh, hosting a whole episode on carbon pricing, which in 85 episodes, we've never done one on carbon pricing. So she's getting my button gear on that one. Uh, it's an excellent show to help 
uh, CCL volunteers, not learn about lobbying necessarily, but about the broad diversity of what's happening in the climate world. So you'll learn about, a lot about environmental justice and, and uh, environmental racism. I have uh, lots of conservatives on the show too, so you hear these conservative perspectives. L uh, last month's episode was about the Bible, like what does the Bible say about climate change? And I spoke with someone from Young Evangelicals for Climate Action who just put out a book about this, and it's a riveting conversation. Ruth contributed to that too. We talked about like, what is your climate life verse? And I'm not gonna reveal what she had, but like it was like, as a Bible scholar, she gave me new information and a revelation of seeing a passage in a whole new way, connecting a passage that has nothing to do with climate change and making it very powerful connection. So it's a good show. You can listen wherever you get podcasts. Usually if you get the, the weekly newsletter, if it comes out that week, it's there. You can just click on the link and listen. Or if you listen to podcasts, subscribe. Uh, you'll get a lot of good stuff out of that. So that's a little bit about me. I know a lot about storytelling. I've been doing it for years. I even married a storyteller. That's not why I married him. But he's a professional writer who's uh, written a memoir about growing up white and gay during apartheid in South Africa. My husband, Glenn Retiff, who can't be with us because he's working on a project right now. So. Little housekeeping, this is a workshop, right? We talked about this, be prepared for work, be prepared to work. When in small groups or on, or on mic, be mindful of time because we wanna make sure we get through everything. I made sure this workshop was a little bit longer than it used to be in the past because you need time to, to think, to write, to plan. If you share your story publicly, be prepared for feedback because that is how we learn to make better stories. My husband, who's a professional writer, no matter, he's been published in all sorts of big places, every time he has a story, he gets feedback from other people. Uh, and we can get kind of precious about our writing or our stories, but that feedback is so helpful to make your story more impactful. So just be prepared for that. If you're gonna share that, I will show you what's good, what's working, and also point out what you could do differently, what's not working. Don't take it personally because that's how we learn to tell better stories. And we will have a question answer response time at the end. All right, we talked about your questions already. Thank you very much for that. So let's talk about our goals. We're gonna identify the components that are a part of effective storytelling. This came up in our questions. We're gonna infuse your story with compelling details and emotion very critical, and we're gonna help you envision and art articulate the impact of climate solutions that will be had on the world. So here's our agenda. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the power of stories. Uh, we're gonna prepare and share a compelling non-climate story. We're gonna first work on a non-climate story, and then we're gonna do the climate pivot, which I cheekily trademarked. It's not really trademarked, but we're gonna talk about the climate pivot and uh, solution stories and give you a chance to share stories, then there'll be Q&A. I don't like PowerPoint, but CCL seems to adore it, so I've adapted to the, to the climate. But you'll see my PowerPoint slides are gonna be very useless. They're mostly photos after a while. We, stories are powerful because we listen to stories with a different part of our brain than we listen to a lecture. When we listen to a lecture, we have this critical part of our brain. So if someone came up to you, no matter where you are, and they said, oh yeah, I wanna tell you about my solution to climate change your filters go up like, ah, okay, who's this person? Where are they coming from? What are they talking about? And that's just how that works. But if someone came up to you or was talking to you and said, let me tell you a story. We move into this kind of relaxed part of our brain that listens differently. And that is a very ancient part of our brain. We've been telling stories. It's like the first technology. We've been telling stories for forever and it has a real power. I want to share with you now the three big mistakes I have been witnessing over the past 10 years with climate stories. Do not feel bad if you've made these mistakes. I have made all of them multiple times. Uh, and it's in a way, many ways we've been trained. I've even trained people to make these mistakes, not realizing they were mistakes. So the first mistake, is it actually a story? I've seen people come to the mic to tell a story, be in a meeting with Congress, and they're talking. There are ideas. They may even refer to themselves, but it's not a story. It's a solution that they're talking about. It's their opinion. Not that those things are bad, 
but it's not a story. And as a result, it doesn't have the power of a story. And it doesn't get the response that people are looking for. It's like, wait, I told you this amazing thing. Why are you not excited about it? Stories have, the, have power, but you, they can be drained of their power. And one of the ways is it's not a story or it doesn't have all the components of a story. Number two, is it your story? I've heard many times people tell great stories about their sister-in-law or a friend. And it's okay to tell a story that includes someone else if you're part of that story. And it's about how it affects you. And it's not about permission necessarily, although telling other people's stories, there's an ethical issue of like, do I have permission to tell this story? But more importantly for my reasons, it is less powerful when you tell this third person narrative. But when it's an eyewitness story, it's my story, you are suddenly an authority that people have to listen to because it is your perspective. So are you telling your story or somebody else's story? And finally, is it the same old story? I have listened to thousands of climate stories. And in a way, I've heard the same story over and over and over again. It just has different details. So it, the story goes like this. I have this hiking trail that I love. And I love going there. It's beautiful. But now, because of climate change, it's been washed out. And I can't go there anymore. Or I have this famous favorite vacation spot. We would go there every year as a family, but because of climate change, I can't go there anymore. My favorite animal on the planet is the fill in the blank, but now because of climate change, it's the same story. And it is a negative story for two reasons. One, it's a story that had to grow out of a reaction to climate denial. Because well over 10 years ago, there was this like, concerted effort to get people to dismiss the importance, the reality, the severity of climate change. So people needed to tell stories to say, look, it's real, I have evidence. We had to point to what was real and to insist that this is really happening. So the story was in reaction to somebody else's talking point. And secondly, it was a negative story because it's bad news. It's you're, you're talking about a problem, and it's a problem you want people to be concerned about, but at the end of the day, you're leaving them with a problem and feeling bad about something. And as a result, they're not motivated. They may be depressed, they may be annoyed, they may be angry, but it doesn't have that like lift that you wanted with like, what can I do then? Other, you know, it, it, it's a downer. So we're gonna avoid these, and we're gonna go in a whole different direction. And the first thing is we need to figure out what do stories need. To be a story, what are the elements? Harken back to elementary school. Remember when the teacher was like doing diagrams about stories and stuff and, and all. And I'll give you the first one, and then I'm going to have you sit for a while and write these down. Every story, most good stories have characters. Remember the characters? And there were these two big words that they used for the characters protagonist and antagonist, right? And the protagonist is someone who faces a challenge. The antagonist, which could be a person or a force, is the thing that brings the conflict or the challenge. All right, I'm gonna give you about a minute, write down a list of other elements that you find are important for a story and I'll let you know when to talk to your neighbor.
All right, if you're online watching this, this would be a good time if you want to compile this list and maybe share it uh, through social media, particularly when we've got the final list down and just kind of say, hey, you want to know what a good story contains? I'm, at the, I'm watching the CCL conference and this is what I learned. For those of you in the room though, you actually have a person you can talk to. So find a partner and just talk for about 60 seconds about what's on your list of what you think are the elements of a story. All right, um, I don't think we'll need the mic for this because it'll just be kind of shouting out. I like all this like chatter too, that's good. All right, someone in this part of the room, raise your hand if you've got something you wanna share about an element of a story in this part of the room. Yes, you with the red. What's that, a plot, yeah. A plot, which is like a narrative. It goes a beginning and an end. Uh, someone in this part of the room. A change. A change. Uh-huh, and what were you gonna say? An exposition. Yeah, so there's often a change that happens in the story. Uh, there's a movement and an exposition, which is sort of like kind of, I, I, what, describe more what you mean by exposition. Yeah, so it's kind of like the storytelling part of the plot, kind of moving it along and, and kind of sharing what happens in the story. Uh, in this middle section, right up here in the front. Uh, there will often be tension. Tension. Often, like someone wanting to do something, they can't do something, and then they So every story, not every story, but many stories have tension, or a conflict is a word that you'll often hear. And this conflict does often come about from having people wanting different things. Someone wants something, somebody wants something different. This creates a conflict. Uh, and often, as an, as an actor, I was trained that like every actor, every character has a want that they may not say out loud, but inside it's what motivates them. Like, I wanna belong, you know? I wanna go out on my own, I wanna leave my family. That may never come out, but it's the, the thing that kind of is that core that moves that character. Yes, details. details. Details are very important, specific details. Suspense. Suspense, yeah, right? I mean, this is what makes true crime podcasts so interesting because you're like, and then they stop at that moment and like, tune in next week, oh, no, the suspense is killing me. Yeah, so there's like, you're uncertain, where is this thing gonna go? It creates suspense. So with that, there's a little bit of uncertainty um, so you don't like spell it out right away, like this is a story about blah, blah, blah. No, let it unfold. Over in this area. Voice or language. Yeah, and a voice is, um, you know, basically the voice, you know, kind of helps with the, the tone. And like, is it snarky? Is it tender? And the language will help with the kind of words you use, the descriptive words and all, it will create a tone. So I'm, I like to use comedy a lot, so I'll use words that are kind of funny at times. But the story I'm gonna tell in a little while is not a funny story, and you'll see the words that I use that will help 
with that voice. Anything else? Setting the where of the story. And, and there will be details around that, but it is good. Otherwise, it's just this story that's floating out in space. But if it has a setting that people can, can visualize and feel, that's really important. The changes in the character or character development. Often a character is a different person in some ways at the end of the story than before. There was, yes? Character motivation, deeper desires, that want they want. Why do they want what they want? Uh, resolution or realization. Yes, often we feel very satisfied when there is a happy ending or at least an ending. This resolution that it, it's a story arc. And often it's like begins, there's a conflict, there's a plateau, and then there's a resolution. It's not the only way to tell a story, but it's very common. In the back, last one. Something you can identify with, yes, and that's harder to decide because you got lots of different people. But again, there are archetypical stories about overcoming challenges, finding something new about yourself, uh, coming of age. So there are types of stories that lots of people can relate to because they're common experiences, even though the details are very different. So. All those were great, and the things that to me are most important for our climate stories are characters, plot, conflict, details, and emotion. Emotion is so important, and emotion is, can be conveyed in multiple ways. It could be you telling how you felt and using descriptive words. It could be you showing the emotion as you tell the story. But this is one part of the story that like, often we don't always talk about and it's a little harder to pin down. But you want to hit the head with the story, the heart, which is the emotion, and the gut. And the gut is that deep want, like I want to protect my children. I want to live in a better, I want to live in a just world, that thing, that like deep motivation. So we're very good with our climate stories often hitting the head. Here's a solution, here's a problem. The heart is how do I feel about this? How does it make me feel? How was I feeling during this moment? How do I feel now? That is revealing that vulnerable under part without having to reveal deep details in your life. And I think about climate uh, speakers, how powerful it, it is when you have someone who's a scientist and they're like, let me tell you about the science of climate change. And they show that graph, you know, that same graph, that's whatever it is. It's always looks the same. It's like, here's the air quality. And, Here's the species, and when I, it's the same graph, right? Um, like, same graph. But then, like, and it's very serious, and everyone's like, oh, my God. but what happens if that scientist, if she steps away from the podium and she takes off her glasses and she says, and I know that, you know, we're talking about the science of this, but for me as a parent, as a dog owner, as a Christian, whatever, for me, this really affects me personally. And sometimes I get really discouraged and I'm really sad about this. I sometimes even feel despair. And in a way, that's why I do this, and that's why I'm so grateful that you're here today. So let me show you more slides that look like all the other slides I showed you. Uh, <laughs> so, so these are important things. The emotion is really important. So I want to play for you two stories, or two videos. These are under one minute. Every episode of Citizens Climate Radio, uh, my team and I, we create videos, uh, a trailer. It's an audio show, you listen to it, but we wanna like capture people's attention online. And I have two examples. Um, this one's from a fairly recent show where I interviewed a young conservative. And basically, I just want you to listen to it. Uh, and it's all good story information, that's why I put it out there. But in the end, I want you to determine, not is it good or is it bad, it's good, but is it a story or not? I think I need volume. Hold on. Whoops, let me go back. All right, let's see if we can do it with volume. Nope, that's not it, go back. Go back again. Okay. All right, we're ready.
Oh, okay. We do have captions, but the sound's important. You want to hear his voice. You want to hear the emotion in his voice. You let me know. You give me the, the heads up when we're ready. In the meeting. There's some tension, right? There's some tension in the room. I'm on screen now. Like, we, like, even lost. Like, this is not prepared. This was an unscripted moment. <laughs> um, while, while we're doing this, this uh, I want to repeat something I said before. You want to have a portfolio of stories that you tell. And I think for too long, many of us had that one story that we loved. And it reminded me when I was going to a church when I was a teenager, and there was this brother Nick would come up, and about every month he would share his testimony of how Jesus saved him. He was a, a bad gambler. And it was like moving. And you can see brother Nick was always very moved by it because he was like in the depths of despair, and then Jesus came and he saved him, and now he's living his life. And at one point, the pastor stood up, and I guess Brother Nick had been telling this story for like 20 years, and he said, Brother Nick, I love it when you tell your salvation story and how you found Jesus and Jesus found you and all, but my question is, um, what else has God done in your life <laughs> since then? Do you have any other stories? And I think we're very, we have a, a soft spot for our own climate story of the thing that motivated us. Catherine Hayhoe from this very podium some years ago said it's our oh shit moment when we're like, bah, what happened? And, and that, that's a powerful story and we feel good telling it, but that's not the only story we can tell. All right, so let's try this again. We're gonna not judge if it's good or bad. Is it a story or is it not a story? Polling from Frank Luntz found that 75% of Republicans under 40 support a carbon fee and dividend, which is really major. That 75% number is something that we're really trying to laser in on and focus on within the Conservative Caucus because there's so much potential there. So I think that it's really, really important that CCLers who are left of center make it a welcoming environment for conservatives because for, for a conservative to get into climate advocacy, they're stepping out of their comfort zone. And you have to be able to accommodate that and make it so they feel comfortable or else they're just gonna leave. We have to have a seat at the table. We have to have a seat at the climate conversation and give our point of view, because if not, then the only climate plan available is things like the Green New Deal. We have to be able to, to say that conservatives want to have their own plan, or else if you're not at the table, you're on the menu eventually, right? Hi, uh, I'm Peter Santoscano, host right, of no, Citizens stop, Climate stop, Radio. We highlight people's story. I guess this is enough of that. All right, if you think this was a story, remain seated. If you think it was not a story and you're able, stand up. All right, it seems like we have consensus, not everyone, but most people think this is not a story. Have a seat. Yeah, it's not a story. It's, he actually, in the podcast, tells a great story of how he got involved with climate change, and I'm not gonna reveal it to you. You should listen to it himself. It's very ironic how he got involved in climate change. Uh, it's a great story, but we didn't want to include that in the, in the trailer. We thought this was kind of good information for people to hear, but it's not a story. It doesn't have a plot. It doesn't have a plot like this is where it begins, this is where it ends. There is a conflict that comes up a bit, like how, you know, conservatives don't always have a place at the table, but it doesn't have all those elements that we talked about. There's really no characters there. There's no plot. There's no clear conflict, there's no antagonist to it, there's no real resolution. It is good ideas, it's opinion, it's a good solid presentation, it's not a story. There is no action in it, true, yeah. And you don't have to have action in a story, I mean it could be like very cerebral or happening in somebody's head, but, but often there is an action in the story. It's great content, it's not a story. Now here's another uh, episode 32, uh, and this is a story, well this is a, 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 the whole episode was about coal and coal miners, and there are stories in it, but again, with this trailer, is this or is this not a story? I didn't want to ruin my health by working in the mines. He worked all his life in the mines, maybe 27, 28 years and uh, his lungs were ruined. His last shift, my brother and I went down to the foot of the hill, uh, 
where our driveway started up to the house and uh, we got him under each arm and helped him up the hill and uh, on the way up he was apologizing I'm sorry I'm sorry uh, I can't work anymore and he couldn't he tried to work a little bit the state road job uh, but it was just sporadic and uh, he really didn't work after that he just couldn't in the last two years he bought he bought I'll just say he fought for every breath he had. A terrible disease. If you think this is a story, stand up. Yeah. And if you think it had emotion, stay standing. It's loaded with emotion. Uh, even though he doesn't talk at once about how he's feeling. And this is a great example of a story that is somewhat about another person, but it is about that person. Like, so he's telling the story of his dad, but how it affected him. He didn't want to work in the mines because of what he saw. And you have this impact. If, it felt, if you felt it had compelling details, remain standing. Yeah, it had some amazing details. You can have a seat. <laughs> I'm mostly having you stand up and down to keep the blood flowing. <laughs> there's, a, there's a method to my madness here. Uh, but no, this is a great example of a story. There is a narrative arc, there's setting. Uh, he doesn't say exactly where he is, but it's in a cold region, so you get that sense. Emotion is in his voice. Uh, the details of him, them carrying, practically carrying their dad up the hill, uh, how he had to fight for every breath. This is, this is a powerful story. There is no resolution, but there is an, an ending. It's, it's sad, it's tragic, it's heavy, um, but it's a very moving narrative that has all of these components. So, our first big assignment, which is technically assignment number two, is you're gonna write a story. It is not going to be a climate story. All right, just wipe that from your head. I know you're here for climate stories, but before you can write a good climate story, you just need to write a good story. Because once you get that down and you know that, then we can talk about a climate story. Can we be in agreement about that? Raise your hand if you're okay with that. If you're not, this is not your workshop then, because this is how we're gonna work it, because our brains have been hacked. And if I told you to write a climate story, you go into this little narrow lane and I want to open this up so you can see there are lots of different climate stories you can tell. I'm going to give you three different prompts, and I'm assuming one of them will register for you. You will have 20 minutes to work on a story. And I don't want you to stay at your table. I want you to find your own table. There are many tables here. This is your time to work alone, quietly, on your story. But before you do, I'm going to show you the prompts, and I'll explain them to you and see if you have any questions about them. All right. So the first prompt that you can write, you're not going to do all three, all right? You're just going to choose one. It's a story about a time in your life when you found it far too difficult or surprisingly, almost like ridiculously easy to complete a major goal in your life. Like maybe you were buying or selling a house, having a baby, applying for school, and you just thought, you know, uh, you, you went in and think, oh, it's good, you know, we'll get it done, but it was like far bigger of a deal than you ever imagined. I hear this story all the time with couples who want to adopt, and it can become this hero's journey that takes decade and a lot of money. Or you expected it to be really hard, but you were kind of shocked. It was like, actually, it went much easier than I expected. So that's story number one, if you have that story in your past. And it could even be your childhood. Your childhood is a treasure trove of stories. Second story, difficulty in finding meaningful employment and you struggle to find this job that's like right for you. Or a story about how you found the perfect job exactly where you wanted to live and just kind of the exhilaration of that. There's some similarities to these two stories because it's like there's an expectation uh, and there is the reality. And you may have thought like, I'm well trained, I should easily find a job, but no. Or the other, other one is like, oh, I could never find a, the job I want, I'm so weird, and then you find it. Like, I don't know, being a climate podcaster. Who knew? Or the last one, 
um, when you, your friends, your community suddenly experienced a burst of creativity. And it could you know, be with like, I don't know, like a town that was dying and suddenly all these new ideas and, and things kind of conspired to just make things happen. It could be when you were in college and you were part of a, a club or you're in college now and like you're in this group and it's just like popping with fresh ideas and, and kind of what that experience was. Now, these are maybe not stories you've told before, you've never even thought about. That's why it's a workshop. You're going to work. It's going to be work on your brain. So before I send you off to your individual tables, anybody have any questions about these three prompts? You're only going to do one. I'm going to leave them up there. Yes, but you need to talk to me first. Because I don't necessarily trust climate storytellers because they're gonna, we're going to end up on that hiking trail again. And I don't want to go down that hiking trail again. So yeah, you can come to me and talk to me. Similarly, if you're stuck, come to me. We'll have my mic off so people won't hear our conversation. But if you get stuck, I will be here or I'll be walking around. And if you get stuck, let me know. But you will have 20 minutes to just sit on your own and work on that story. Uh, you don't have to have everything worked out, but I want you to have those components we talked about. Characters, conflict, plot, details, and emotions. Yes? Yeah, three minutes. It's a three-minute story, which is long. Those, that his story was one minute. He got a lot into one minute. And if you can get your story down to one minute, that is a powerful, wonderful thing. Now, some stories do take longer, but you can take a slice of the story. Or if you feel it's like an epic that needs to be a novel or a memoir, you might want to choose something else or just do an overview and summarize parts of it. Any other questions? Yes? All right. You, you have two choices. You can go out and we just say, thank you for your time. Or you can like pretend you're angry and you stomp out. And we can say, see, look, some people can't handle this. <laughs> no, that's fine. Thank you. And thank you for being a mentor. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh, so yeah, telling a good story kept them going and then you got a little nerdy and you lost your audience. Yeah, you've got to figure out a way to keep them engaged. All right, you have 20 minutes. Go find your space. Take your time. Feel free to write notes, outline. You can draw pictures if you like. Uh, you can draw a map if you like. These are your prompts. If you get stuck, come to me. If these don't work, come to me and I will approve the story you have. And you can turn off my mic now, Pedro.
begin wrapping up your last few words. And if you're done, go back to your table. Don't worry if you don't finish it. That's not the assignment. Okay, as you come back to the table, you will not finish the story today uh, for some of you, and that's fine because that's the assignment isn't to walk away with a complete story, but to learn these basics. Uh, and one question people will have, like, is my story too long? And the answer is yes, it definitely is too long. It's always too long. Uh, Ruth can tell you this with Citizens Climate Radio, we will interview someone and have like, like 70 minutes of audio, and we have to cut that down really till about six minutes. And I have never made a cut that I ever regretted. It's hard to imagine because you think it's all so critical, but it's nice having a time limit because it forces you to really figure out what is critical or not. Uh, and that is really useful. And so there's a phrase that writers often talk about, kill your darlings. There may be parts of that story you love. It's so good, it's so interesting, but it doesn't support the overall story. Get away from it. All right, what I want you to do, um, oh, the other thing I want to tell you is that um, this is somewhat of an artificial way of creating stories that you're going to speak because we're looking at an oral tradition for the most part, although they will be potentially written stories. But just so you know, when I write a story like this, I'm often not doing it just on paper. I'm doing it out loud, speaking it, where I might have the basics, but I begin by just talking about it. Uh, but I'm a playwright and I've written whole plays that way, but the more you, articulate it when you have the opportunity, the clearer it will become. So not just keeping your head, not just keeping on the paper, the next stage will be getting it out and we're gonna give you a chance to, to do that in a moment. But before you do that, I want you to go through uh, your stories and I'm gonna go back for a moment here. And first I want you to circle in your story every place there's a character. Just go through and just circle characters. Could be a name, could be referred to somebody. You could do it just once for each character. Uh, if you like, you can also do it every time the character appears. But I want you to at least recognize, I have characters, here they are. I want you to put a square around a place that you can identify where the conflict is somehow stated or seen. Like, that, like this is an example of where the conflict is. To identify you have a conflict. And you hopefully added details, and these are not just details of like name places, but descriptive details uh, about what these places looked like, smelt like, what you know things sounded like. So I want you to put a check mark by every place you see there is a detail listed, all the details. I hope you have at least two checks, please. <laughs> and finally, I want you to put an emoji by every emotion, meaning like a smiley face, a sad face, and if you're more creative, other types of faces, but an, emotion, an, an emoji near an emotion, all emotions.
pulling from All right, if you were able to respond to every one of those prompts and find those things that I was saying, all those things, raise your hand. All right, because these are the elements of the story that we're looking for. Uh, I didn't mention plot because you may not be at the end and it's, hard to, it's harder to track plot if you have it or not. You'll know when you tell the story if there is a story there, a plot. But these are the things that often people leave out, the emotion in particular. I'm gonna give you a moment to find a partner and to share your story. You will have three minutes, and I know your story is massive. So this means you're gonna have to summarize it, um, but what you want to get the most out of, and it might only just be a section. They don't, they, don't all, they don't need to know every detail of your story. They don't need to know like the whole setup necessarily. I want you to, I want you to share a story that you have so that at the end of your three minutes, they want to know more. Right? You want to hook them with your story. So don't feel like you have to tell them the whole, whole backstory. Just kind of jump right in at some point. So this was the problem and you know, kind of go on there. However you want to abridge it, but you have three minutes. So it means you might not want to read it. Or if you feel it's like tight and good, great. But as much as you can, I want you to show the emotion in your voice and in the words that you use include those, those details that will give them a picture of it, give them the smell of it, the feel of it, and, um, and of course have some, some characters who are going through some sort of a, a crisis. You may not get to the resolution, that's fine, that's the suspense, like what's gonna happen? Sorry, you'll have to wait until I tell the whole story. So you will have six minutes altogether, and I will tell you when to switch. So if you're not done at the end of your three minutes, it's a cliffhanger. All right, so first find your partner, identify your partner, and if you don't have a partner, raise your hand so someone can partner up with you. I don't want groups of threes. We need a partner over here, who needs a partner? If you don't have, if we have a, there's a partner over here, anybody else need a partner, you need a partner? If someone is without a partner, come see me. There should only be one, <laughs> if I know math. There should just be one. Don't tell your story yet. Do you need a partner? Come to me. All right. All right. Tension. All right. So identify who's going to tell the story first. Just kind of somebody choose. I'm going first. Raise your finger. Don't start your story yet. I'm like such a mean teacher. All right. When I say go, you'll have three minutes to tell your story. Ready, set, <laughs> story. It is, I know.
you're talking, stop and switch for the other person to tell a story. All right, and that is time. Your time is up. Your TikTok is over. Go back to your seat. Stop talking. <laughs> I know, your story is riveting, particularly for yourself, right? It's like, oh my gosh, it's the best story ever. I hope, I hope you're feeling that, that, um, that you're excited about the story. How many of the story listeners uh, felt, oh no, that's not fair to say. I was gonna say, felt like you were at the edge of your seat and you wanted to hear more, but you're sitting next to the person, so you don't really wanna. <laughs> but I'm hoping that that was, that was part of it. Um, how many people heard specific details? Raise your hand. What about emotion? Yeah, um, and you had characters, I'm assuming. Did characters come up? Very good, all right. So I'm gonna tell you a quick story uh, to kind of do a sample because I'm gonna give a couple people a chance to share their story with the group. So people with mics, be prepared for that. And if you're gonna share your story, you're gonna come up here to tell your story. Uh, so you need to be willing and prepared for that. So I'm gonna tell you a story and I want, as I tell the story, I want you just to listen for details that I include, the characters and the conflict. And of course, look out always for emotion. So 
when I was a young kid, in fact, I'm in that photo, I'm in my mom's belly at the moment. That's my mom and dad, Pete and Anita Toscano, and my sister Nardina. My dad was a welder in Stamford, Connecticut. He had a union job, and it was such a good job, my mom got to be a stay-at-home mom. And my very first memory, we always had lots of kids around, that's me in the middle, I, I like hats, I did from the beginning. I'm a snappy dresser, and I apparently like blue. Uh, and, and my very first memory that I look back on was sadly not a happy memory. It was a memory of a lot of fear, and there was a lot of noise, and I felt like I was sinking and drowning, and there was movement. I was having an asthma attack, one of many asthma attacks. I was rushed to the hospital, and it turned out that our neighborhood was incredibly dangerous because of all the pollutants. In fact, my dad worked at a plastic factory at the end of our block. And my parents, who like, they just, their big thing was, we want our kids to be happy and healthy. They said, we need to do something. This is a bad place for our family to live, even though it was such a great place with community and jobs. So they did something radical. They moved us as a family up to the Catskills in upstate New York in the countryside, which terrified me because it was very lonely. It was very dark. It was very different for me, but it was very good for my health. And I began to breathe easily and I started to be a healthier person. My sister also had developed asthma and almost immediately we moved and we felt better. And that sounds like a happy ending to a story, but it, it wasn't. Um, because my parents suddenly had a very challenging life. Because my dad, who was a hard worker, he could not find work in this rural area. He was well-skilled as a carpenter, as a welder, but he only can get work maybe six, seven, eight months out of the year because it was a lot of seasonal work. And the rest of that time, he wasn't earning money and he was forced to get uh, unemployment insurance, which galled him as a U.S. Marine, a former U.S. Marine. He wanted to take care of his family, and he felt, felt like he was really not doing his job. Now, I didn't know this at the time. My parents did everything they could to give us a, a, a wonderful family life, you know, with vacations whenever possible. I had no idea how poor we were, how much we didn't have, and how much they worried throughout our childhood to just rob Peter to pay Paul. I would hear my mom say this. I didn't know who Peter or Paul was. My dad was Peter, but why is she robbing from him? I didn't understand. And so I, um, I'm gonna move on. And so I didn't realize what a hard childhood I had because my parents wanted to shield us from that. And it was only years later when they were older and sick and dying and stories started coming out that I realized what tremendous efforts they made to make our lives better. Was that a story? Did you hear any emotion? Yeah, details? Characters? Yeah, so what I want is for a volunteer who has, remember we had our three stories, there was story number one. If you wrote a story number one and you feel comfortable to share, even though it's only, it's not complete, we understand that, this is a work in progress, it may be too long, it is too long, um, but you're willing to share it and you're under the age of 35. Raise your hand if you're under the age of 35 and you're willing to share that story and you're willing to come up on stage. Okay, come on up. Round of applause, come on, that takes a lot of strength. If you uh, have story number two and you are willing to share it, come on stage and you identify as female, raise your hand. Oh, I see that hand. Come on up with a scarf, yeah. Yeah, and you can stand to the side if you like for now so you don't have to be awkwardly on stage. Oh. And, I'll, and I'll need the mic up here, Ruth, or whoever has the mic. And finally, for um, story number three, if you have story number three, and you're anyone in this room with story number three, and you're willing to come up and share that story, and you can promise that you can keep to three minutes, 
men often struggle with that. I just have to say, as a man myself, come on up. Yeah, come stand to the side. Thanks. So first, you're our first round of applause. Thank you so much for coming up and doing this. Please just introduce yourself to everyone. Okay, um, my name is uh, Harita, and I am from California, and I'm an incoming college freshman. Thank you. Now, as storytellers, it's really important to get feedback, but you don't want to interrupt the storyteller. So every time you hear emotion, we're going to do what we learned this morning, just put your hand over your heart. Every time you hear emotion in that story, put your hand over your heart so that, that we can see that you're, that's tracking with you. And every time you hear a specific detail, put your finger up. And this is nice kind of feedback for the storyteller and it keeps you engaged. You have three minutes, share it however you like. Okay, so this was a few years ago and I was in middle school and I got invited on a Boy Scout camping trip in Yellowstone. And it was a really cool opportunity, and I was like, oh, I definitely feel like I should go. I love camping. So I was there for a week, um, and we got to stay in tents. We got to tour just around the entire park, and it was really fun. Um, and one night, we stayed up until probably around midnight, um, and we went to back to our tent, and everything was fine. And then I felt like this little pokey thing behind my head, and I was like, that is really weird. Maybe something fell out of the tree above us or whatever. Um, but then within five minutes, everybody else started to feel something right behind their head too. So we were like, okay, we should go outside and see what is out there because there's obviously something, something was up, you know? And so we go outside and there is a giant bison just right next to our tent, right up against our tent. And at this point, we're all freaking out because we're like, what if this thing literally kills us in the middle of the night? Like, that would be really bad. Um, so we go wake up one of the adults, and we all go um, to, like, the ranger site, and we're like, there's a bison up against our tent. What should we do? And they were like, oh, it's, it's no big deal. Like, they're, they're not going to hurt you as long as you um, just stay quiet in the middle of the night. And so we were all, like, terrified. Keep in mind, this is, like, a bunch of, like, 12 year old girls like in a tent just like oh my god this bison is gonna wake up and like what if we snore too loud or whatever you know and so we're there and then the bison starts snoring and we're like oh my god like you know and we could not sleep like we were so scared um, and then eventually we heard it move around like around and then we heard it get up and leave which was a relief um, and even though it was terrifying in the moment, I feel like being there was just such a cool experience, honestly, um, because how many people can say that they've slept next to a bison before? You know, not a lot. <laughs> Hang out here for one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Harita, for telling that story. Um, lovely, right? Um, and I saw fingers going up. I definitely saw a lot of heart action, right? There were a lot of emotions here in this story and you were able to get a nice trajectory of a plot, beginning, end, conflict. You brought other characters in, the, the other campers, of course, and the counselors, and then you know all these other people were in. The bison was clearly a character in the story, part of the conflict there. Uh, you've got all, all of those elements. So it's a very solid story. It's, got a, it's compact. You were able to fit into the time period. The one thing you could do to make it even better is add more details that kind of bring it to life. So for instance, I, you said you were all in a tent. I couldn't tell if it's like two to a tent, 10 to a tent, like kind of describe like there were four of us packed in this little tent, uh, you know, like a detail like that. We all looked at each other, like what did that look like? What was that look you gave? You could even then perform it if you're doing this speaking. We looked at each other like whatever the look was. Um, same thing, you can give people names, either their real names or other names. So we had to call, you know, talk to our, our counselor, Gladys. You know, just giving a name makes it a real person. If it's a funny story, you can give a name that, you know, might be a little bit more unexpected or humorous, uh, if you like. Or you can choose the person's real name. Often I don't include the last name. 
So like details like that, and then details about what you remember seeing of the bison. Because I, I, I don't, I think I know what a bison is, um, but it would be good to kind of like talk about the size of it, like, you know, what it looked like, and you know, like it's, did it have a smell? The snoring was very nice, that was a very good detail, and very funny. I like how you brought humor to that story. So thank you very much. All right, here comes our next storyteller. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Victoria Olson, uh, recently of Waldo, Maine, uh, before that of New York City. And I have story number two. It is about difficulty in finding meaningful employment. As a child, I was drawn to fantastical stories particularly around extraordinary or even so-called supernatural human abilities like clairvoyance or telekinesis. Their use also in solving vexing human problems. I was drawn to Bible stories. I settled on Jesus as a career path, life path, <laughs> seemed good. This was in the late 1960s and early 1970s, so this period, uh, this personal Jesus was a war hippie Jesus. He was a clearing the temple Jesus. He was a laying on of hands and faith healing Jesus, and I was fascinated with the, the Mary thing, romance. So not such a clear career path, but eventually I got training as a massage therapist, laying on of hands. I had micro goals, I had macro goals in a large sense. I wanted people to be more relaxed and present in their bodies so they would feel better and they would be more available for fun and games. I wanted to have fun. Also, I felt that touch was the most healing thing for a body, particularly the kind of touch that fills a person's well rather than just extracting energy from them. And I also believe that healthcare and self-care are casual things. They're not luxurious, they're not indulgences, they are mundane things, they're no big deal, they're not a special occasion. So I got my training at the Swedish Institute in New York City. I emerged from the rarefied atmosphere with high ideals. I set forth to find my career, I set forth to have fun. My first job was at a famous bathhouse in the Lower East Side. It was a Russian-Turkish bathhouse. It's been there for more than 100 years, and famous people who you've probably heard of went there. It was co-owned by some Russian emigres who were running it like a crime scene, but I didn't know that. <laughs> because what had happened there for me was a woman gave me a massage that changed my life. She was gifted. Her touch liberated something in me. It liberated a profound human dignity that I had never felt before. I felt worthy as a human being of the deepest honor and regard, and it wasn't for a trait or a quality, but simply for the wonder and glory of creation expressed through my being. I began my employment with high hopes that <laughs> crashed pretty fast. <laughs> I had some pleasant clients who appreciated my talent and abilities. I also encountered the happy endings crowd who viewed touch as always a precursor to some kind of sexual gratification. That's what I was looking to transcend. The stereotypes of massage as sex, luxury, or special occasion. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger, hold, hold on to that mic, thank you. Ooh, what happens next? This was the East, East 10th Street bathhouse, is that correct? Yes. Yes, uh, it's a good place. Yeah, I always had a massage there too that kind of changed my life. It was kind of, it's, yeah, it's a yeah. wacky place. And I remember the men, like there were a lot of older men that were beating the snot out of each other with branches. And I thought, this is new for me. This is a new experience. So um, I, um, so, at the beginning, the first half of the story, was it more this or this for you? Yeah, it was structured in a way that there were lots of details up front, but there wasn't a lot of this up front. Um, but towards the end of the story, there was a lot of heart. 
right? There was a lot of feelings there. It was an interesting, I don't know if you planned structuring it that way, but that was structured. And when we tell stories, we get to structure them. So you had all these details, they were very specific details, they were very clear, and then you've got that, the emotion of you know, like what the impact was, not on, just on your body, but you know, on your heart and this longing that you had. And then you begin to come to the conflict where you wanted to get this, you, know, you wanted to be able to do something similar, it sounds like. We don't know what's gonna happen next, but you started getting that conflict in. So there's a very clear trajectory. It was visual, it was, um, you know, there were feelings there and you told it with feeling as well, right? Like there was emotion when you shared the story. So this works really well. The, one of the keys will be how do you condense it so you get to the conflict mm -hmm. a little sooner. If you have three minutes, think by about one and a half minutes I need to be at my conflict. If possible, that be, you know, because it's kind of in the middle or even a little bit before that because you want to have time for the rest of that story. If you have more time to tell the story, of course, you know, spread it out. But you want to know more about the story, right? Yeah, I do. You'll have to seek her out and find out more. Uh, yes? Yeah, she could. That is one way you can structure a story, like kind of put it out there up front. The, the Jesus stuff was like just so compelling and interesting. I had no idea where it was going to go. I love that suspense. But yeah, sometimes you can give it away right at the beginning, but other times it's like, so where's this going? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our final victim, I mean storyteller. <laughs> You're being such great sports here. All right, you have three minutes. So Michael, introduce yourself and then get into your story, and I will come up at three minutes. Hey, I'm uh, Mike Ellis. I'm here from Burlington, Vermont, and uh, I've got another scout story. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, this happened about 30 years ago when my son joined the local Boy Scout troop uh, in Lexington, Massachusetts, where we were living at the time, and uh, I had been a, well, I, I was a volunteer leader along with uh, a good friend of mine whose son was the same age, and uh, we'd been on a couple of camping trips and we were just really tired of sleeping on rocky ground. You know, they were getting a little older and, uh, and uncomfortable. So Mark had this brilliant idea. He said, you know, they sell these long, stretchy nylon mesh hammocks that we could, uh, that we could, could use and, and tie between two trees. And I said, that's great, it's light, you know, we could, uh, uh, not have to carry a tent, and so so the next camping trip was in the spring, late spring, and we were in Bethel, Maine, and uh, so the plan was to spend two nights, uh, uh, one when, when we got up there right at the campground, and the other was to hike with the kids up a 4,000 foot mountain and uh, spend the night there. Um, so first night was great. Mark and I found trees, stretched out our hammocks, uh, uh, were relaxed and uh, weren't sleeping on the rocks. It was good, and we felt clever. And uh, so next day, hike with the kids up. Very pleasant day up up the mountain, uh, cross a little stream, uh, get up to the top, and it began to rain. And it really began to rain. And it rained, and it ra it's as miser it was as miserable a night as I've ever spent. In spite of having you know rain flies over the hammocks. We were soaked. I ended up crawling into the tent where my son and his friend were and just laying there shivering because my sleeping bag was soaked. Uh, by the time the night was over, everybody was soaked. It just it was pouring. And so in the morning, I mean, it was, it was getting to be a little bit of a serious situation. The rain had slacked off, but these kids were soaked. Uh, we were worried about hypothermia. It wasn't that warm. And so we had to get them down the mountain. So we go back down the mountain carefully because things are slick now. And then we came to that little stream that we crossed the day before. It was a raging torrent. It was absolutely too dangerous to bring the kids across. It was probably um, 25 or 30 feet wide, but it was probably about three feet deep. And it was just, we, we tried, the strongest guy in the group uh, you know, felt even he was a little risky at it. So we had a problem. We didn't have any way to get across the stream. We had to get across it. We there didn't have any rope or anything like that. 
And suddenly my friend Mark looked at me and he said, our hammocks, they're made of nylon, they're strong. If we tie them together, I think they'll reach across. And so we did and tied one end to a tree right at the bank on the other side. And, and John, the scout leader, who was the strongest guy in the group, made his way across carrying the hammock, stretched it out in a taut line, and then one kid by kid with an adult on either side, we got them all across and got the poor little bedraggled guys down to the car and, and got them warm. And that's my story. Oh, I don't know who had that. Uh, thank you. Um, did you see it? Did you feel it? Right? Like lots of details. You included, you know, your friend's name. Um, oh, I thought you were doing something, saying something. I thought it was a message in the back. I was like, what's this message I'm getting? Um, there was a lot of details. I saw lots of fingers, very specific details, strong words. Now, something that we didn't talk about, but you do brilliantly, is pacing and breath. Like you paused at times, you used your voice as an instrument to tell the story so that it wasn't just the words, but the pause. I mean, do you notice how he like is kind of using his voice? So it's not like one tone, but like there's a pause, there's a change in tone. Uh, so I saw a lot of that, there was a lot of that. How many times would you say you did this in the story? Once or twice. So I would say what your story could use more of is emotion. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, what well, I was thinking as you were telling your story, and I was relating to it because as a leader, you know, you think about like your experience, this, you're responsible for this, how I would be feeling as a leader with these charges in front of me. And either in your, in your voice or in saying like, you know, how you felt, that's good because it brings people in. So you got people to see it, but you can get them to feel more what you were feeling. And also, uh, again, the details, though, like bedraggled. So, I mean, like all these wonderful descriptive words were really, really sharp. And I think, you know, for all of us, at least for me, I definitely saw it, I felt it, and the tension that was there, and the resolution was beautiful, and you kept right to your time period. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. And I can give this back to somebody if uh, we need it. Uh, just a quick time check, am I correct? We have another another 20 minutes, is that correct? We go to 12.30? Okay, good. All right, so what on earth does any of this have to do with climate change? Well, A, you need to tell compelling stories. You need to tell stories that people are not gonna switch off. They don't go into zombie mode. And if you can tell a story with the details, these elements, and you look for them, you circle them, you find them, you have a better chance of keeping their attention. But here is the hack that I've learned in telling climate stories. You need to tell a story for the most part, unless you're talking to a climate audience and people who are already engaged, you need to not quite trick them, but you need to structure your story in such a way that they don't know it's a climate story. Because as soon as you indicate it's a climate story, they start listening with a different set of ears. They will go to that critical part of their brain. They may shut down. They may assume you're gonna talk about something. They, they may not hear you anymore because they may feel fear or they may feel guilt. Oh, I don't do enough. So I don't wanna hear this. Do not indicate, I'm gonna tell you a climate story. Just say, I wanna tell you a story and tell a story that seemed to have nothing to do with climate change. Like a story about being a kid with asthma that had to move to the countryside and hated it and then had a great life but didn't realize how hard it was for my dad in particular who couldn't find the employment that he wanted. So while, while it was a safe place for me, it was really a difficult, painful, humiliating life for my dad. And I tell you this story because I am a strong proponent to put a price on carbon. This to me is very important because once we put a price on carbon, it will change the market. So suddenly there will be a need for more renewable energy. And that renewable energy can't be all done in one little center hub somewhere and spread out. These are local projects in every town, every village, every place across the United States. Skilled workers who can build things suddenly will have an excess of jobs to work on. And there will be 
people moving to the area to build these projects, to retrofit homes, to insulate homes, to build all kinds of structure, and it will be this amazing opportunity so that people could live, like my dad, could live in the place that's good for his family and also provide for his family. And similarly, that's why I'd like you to look at permitting reform because there are all these projects that can be done in little towns like Lake Huntington where I grew up, but they're not happening because there's too many hurdles to jump. And as a result, these jobs aren't happening. So I'd love it for someone who's like my dad or my mom to be able to have that work. So please, can we talk about how we can pass better permitting modernization so these projects could happen in little towns like Lake Huntington and other towns like it all over the country? This is what I call the climate pivot. It's a registered trademark of mine. <clears throat> it's not really, you could use it. But it's when you take your story that seems to have nothing at all to do with climate change. But it does. Now it may not be a story that has to do with mitigating climate change and carbon fee and dividend. It may have to do a story with resilience which is a very important story to tell because like it or not, no matter how successful we are and we will be successful, we will be feeling the impacts. We are feeling the impacts of climate change. We will continue to feel the impacts of climate change. They will happen long after we're gone. So we need to have people who are resilient, who are able to face these challenges and overcome it. So that's an important story to tell. Um, it's a very one that can engage people in a very powerful way. But I'm not saying every story you, can, you tell can be connected to climate change. But I believe many of the stories that you hold, many of the stories you have on your page, you can make a connection to a climate solution. Because the problem with climate solution stories is it's hard to point to what the solution can do because they haven't happened yet, right? It's speculative. We have the solution and we believe the world will be like this when we have the solution in place. But unless you're a time traveler, you can't say, I witnessed this, unless it was a local solution that you can say, yeah, we did this in our home, in our community, and this is how it's better. So in telling better climate stories, you want to get away from the stories that talk about the impacts of climate change. Those have been told. There may be a place for them, for sure. But instead, you want to do the hard work of revealing why we need solutions and the impacts of those solutions. And to do that, you may have to go back into the past, find a story, and connect it to climate change. So for instance, we had three different stories just now. We had a story about, um, we had a story about a bison, right? And that came into the f category number one of um, finding something was either much harder or much easier to deal with. And this seemed like it was a lot harder. Like, you think it's a bison. How big of a deal is it to, sh you know, go, go, go? But apparently it was much harder than it needed to be. And the people who should be helpful weren't particularly helpful. And it was up to the children to save the planet yet again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of different pivots you can do with the story. But I see a lot of those stories in category number one could be a story that pivots to permitting reform, which I have to say is not the sexiest topic on the, on the planet right now, but it is very interesting to members of Congress. So it's a humorous story, and you can say, you know, you tell this story, people laugh, it's engaging, that's really funny, and they hearing something from a climate advocate they're not used to hearing, oh, that's a fun story, and then they say, now, it's a weird story to tell you on, while we're lobbying about climate change, but I'm telling you this story because, you know, we needed help. And the people who were there either couldn't help us, wouldn't help us, or didn't have the means to help us. And something that should have been very easy, shooing a bison away, uh, that needed to be done, because it actually was dangerous, potentially, um, it wasn't in place. And I tell you this story because that's true, too, of the projects that need to be built that will protect us, that will bring clean energy. It's, it's not happening. The people who have the power to do it aren't doing it for some reason, or they don't feel like they have the ability to. There's all these blockages, and we're having to dream up something to happen that we can't do without there being some reform in permitting. It's a weird story about a bison, but I want us to talk about permitting reform. It seems like a strange kind of connection, but could you imagine it as a letter to the editor? People are gonna read the story. Right? They're going to like, what the heck? This is so interesting. What's funny? And, about, you know? and then 
suddenly they like it's connected to some issue that they never thought of and they they're with you to the end and they'll stick with you to the end as particularly if you're like yeah find out more you're also signaling what kind of a person you are as a climate advocate you're not the same old you know hippie ag uh, climate person that they have in their mind, but you're someone who has a full life that is interesting, that can tell good stories. You're someone they're like, I wanna have lunch with this person. They seem like a really cool person. You're not just selling your idea, you're selling yourself. Story number two, what was our story number two? Massage, right? So this is the story number two about someone who has a, a dream of being in a profession but found it much harder than it should have been, at least I think that's where you were going, to, to get that position. That was my, my dad's story too, the story of being you know, underemployed or unemployed and the pain of that. As you saw, I made a pivot to, to Climate Solutions, the Energy Innovation Act. You know, with a carbon fee and dividend, there are gonna be a lot of new jobs. That's one of the things that we keep talking about in CCL. There are a lot of new jobs that will come from this. And so there's a way you can pivot that and talk about the jobs. And for Republicans, for those of you who want to talk to Republicans, they care about jobs. They care about jobs in their district. And so if there's a way that you can demonstrate that, that like one of the impacts of this climate solution is that. And for folks you know, who are watching this online, I would love to hear your stories as well. And I believe my, name, my email has been put into the chat so you can feel free to email me and I will love to hear your story and give you feedback to that as well. Uh, similarly, for anyone here, I'll be here all week, obviously, so feel free to pull me aside, tell me a story, ask your questions, but we still have a little time for questions, of course. Story number three, it's another story of uh, Boy Scouts, or scouting, uh, and also a challenge. Uh, it was a challenge that they were able to overcome because they came up with some very creative solutions. We're seeing this now with climate change. Right? There are these wicked problems. And if you ever listen to Yale Climate Connections, it's this like short, it's like a, a 60 second show, 60 to 90 seconds, where they talk very often about in innovative solutions. And I heard about, you know, you know about like different ways of getting energy from waves. This has been, you know, something they talked about. You can generate energy from waves. But in Portland, Oregon, they tried something interesting and they, they basically put, uh, a turbine in a water main in the city. So every time the water is going through, which is all the time, it's generating energy. I'm like, that's a clever idea. And it doesn't affect, you know, wildlife, it, you know, it's there. And, you know, and so those kind of stories, we live in a time of great innovation because of, of climate change. But the problem is there's not enough, there's not enough pushing people to innovation because there's not enough money out there. And so with the Inflation Reduction Act, there's chance for more innovation. Uh, with the carbon fee and dividend, there's definitely time for more innovation to happen there. So with the third story, it was about that burst of creativity that often comes from a crisis. This could be related to resiliency, which is an important story to tell. For people who maybe are, don't have the stomach for climate lobbying and you need to have a strong constitution to do what we do. It's not for everybody. They recognize that my individual efforts really don't matter in mitigating climate change. I could take the shortest shower on the planet. I could be vegan. I could not drive. And really, it's like giving an aspirin to a cancer patient. It's nice, but it doesn't do anything. Right? And people know that in their gut. And they've been lied to for years, saying, if we all do our part, it's all going to add up. And if you've ever been to the En Road uh, demonstration, you realize that's not true. Stop this lie. But where your individual actions really make an impact is in preparing for disaster and in building stronger communities. Because as Dr. Natasha Dedrinet has said from the stage before, that one of the most powerful things we can do to prepare for the impacts of climate change is to have strong, cohesive communities that are connected. And as a result, I've become a member, I've become a volunteer of the Red Cross. Uh, and they have amazing opportunities for people who have counseling background, uh, religious background, they have a whole like spiritual support people who go when there's a disaster and you can go and provide spiritual support. They will train you to do really practical things, to teach people how to make emergency kits in their own community. 
This is significant climate work. It's not the work we do with CCL, but it's work that you can really engage your neighbors in, in ways that they're not gonna be interested in this. And it's respecting that not everyone is gonna be a CCL volunteer, but they have an important part to play. Hospitality is a, a climate action. Just this week in the Northeast with the bad smoke, people were sending out messages. I have air conditioning. Um, I have clean air in my house. If you need a place to stay, come and stay with me for a couple days. That is significant climate action. So we have just a few minutes left. And so I want you to take first um, just two minutes and look at your story and just, just see if anything comes to you, if there's any possible climate pivot in your story. And it's just gonna be a question, maybe this? Give you a few moments. And we'll have the mic ready soon for questions. All right, we have five minutes for questions, responses, or even takeaways. I think it's always very important, if you don't have a question, just like, what's one thing you're taking away from this workshop? I'm not looking for praise. I love praise. You can give it to me later. But like, what's something you learned? You're like, I want to remember this. Uh, I want to hold on to this. Or I have a question about this. And Ruth is going around with the microphone. And say your name, please. Yeah, my name is Dane. Um, do you have any resources for people who are interested in learning more after this presentation that you would recommend? Um, have you heard of Citizens Climate Radio, our <laughs> podcast? There's actually a two-part uh, two episode about telling better climate stories that was out earlier this year, and it talks very specifically about that pivot, gives really good examples as well. CCL also does a training uh, that I do for them every, just about every six months or so, where it's an online training with other people. There's one other um, resource that you can find right down the Cli Fi Imaginarium. And just do a Google search for that, withmanyroots.org. They hold a monthly climate fiction workshop. What's lovely about this is they talk about a specific solution that is in Project Drawdown, which is an excellent book. It has a hundred solutions. They make you like, so you understand the solution. And then they encourage you to write a story in the future where this solution is part of that world. It may be not a story about the solution, but it's a, about the world. It's um, withmanyroots.org. They have a whole collection of these stories that are very interesting and inspiring. And you could also go to the workshops for free online and get practice doing this as well. Uh, CCL on community, there are some storytelling uh, resources there as well. Other questions, takeaways? Over here, wherever, where's our mic? Hi. Oh, you have the mic. Oh, yeah. I can't see, see with these really lights. Well. Uh, okay, so hello, I'm Himanshu. Uh, I'm from the Rochester, New York chapter. Uh, my question uh, is uh, somewhere along the lines of the in audience you're trying to impact. During the workshop, I personally found some muddled understanding of when I'm telling a story in a conversation versus when I'm telling a story on an editorial versus when I'm telling a story on a video. And uh, I, like I, didn't quite understand uh, what is the process of you trying to figure out what the story should look like, depending on the audience. And a second half -er of this question is just, how do you include data into the 
these stories because as you mentioned lectures are indeed boring yeah, yeah. but i think data has some very very uh, uh big role to play in helping people understand especially people who are who find themselves intellectually driven uh how do you suggest uh, data be included in these perfect stories? yeah i can easily answer both those questions uh if you're telling the same story the same way every time you're doing it wrong you have to tell it, you have to adjust it to the audience. So that story I told about the asthma, I, that, that is how I would tell it to people in my district which are you know, very conservative. I can tell the very same story to a group of progressives from New York City but focus more on the asthma part of it and environmental justice. I would put much more emphasis on that first part of the story and how unfair it was that it was easy for my family, which was white, to move from that neighborhood up to the Catskills compared to the kids in my class who were mostly black who would not be welcomed in the same community back then because of racism. There's a, you tell the same story, but you focus on different details for the audience that you're talking to. It will change the language you use as well. Uh, similarly, if you're just chatting with a friend, it's very different than speaking in front of the Rotary Club. So these stories can be, many of these stories can be adapted for these different audiences. The language has to change, the length might have to change, the, the style, the one time it could be more funny, other times they gotta be more serious, depending. And not every story will work with every venue. And so you'll find like, oh, that didn't work well here, we won't do that one again here. That's why it's important to have more than one story. Uh, but many of the stories can work as a letter to the editor, often if it's a compelling story. How to get data in, the important thing is, don't overdo it, right? One or two really good facts to reinforce what you're saying. You know, unless it is a lecture, then they need the data. But for something like this, like in Citizens Climate Radio, it's not data heavy, but when it's in important, we include some data facts. Uh, and, and we may not always, for radio, don't like say the exactly of like, you know, 5.37%, we'll say, you know, over 5% you know, of the people are not concerned about this. So you round up or round down the numbers. But th it's very important because it gives extra authority. Your primary authority is coming from being an eyewitness, a first person narrative. But you can then support that with one or two important facts that reinforces your story. In fact, in the district where I grew up, you know, there was a 22% employment rate and most of it were skilled laborers. That would be an important fact to kind of slide in. You know, compared to this neighborhood, which you know now they have carbon dividend, whatever, and it's much higher. We have time for one more question, takeaway, final word. Just building on his excellent question about the the data thing and talking about the sort of the boring slides. As a geeky person myself, I really think that there really is a value in people understanding some of the aspects of climate science. What is a tipping point? What is a feedback? Um, thinking a little bit about how to take that momentum that you've built with the initial story to carry through the part that could be a lecture, but keep that lecture engaging is something that, it, that that's sort of getting after me. Like, I don't want to go light on the, the nitty gritty. I want right. people to get that nitty gritty, but they need that narrative to carry them there, and I'm, that's what I'd like to... Um, Again, it, it depends on the venue and how much time you have if you're in front of a college audience or whatever, it's, it would be different. But in a way, we're speaking in metaphors. We're helping people grapple concepts that maybe they will turn off of. So a tipping point, for instance, could you tell a story about how someone has a tipping point in their own life, right? Like, like what, does that, what does a personal tipping point look like? Do you have that story? Then with that, you can then take apart the pieces of that story and say, so there are three elements to a tipping point. I'm making that up. And so element number one, well, when I said this, it's kind of this. Then you break down the data and all that. So they have this touch point for people who are novices at this. They're, you know, this is not their field. Uh, and you can then reference back to the story to keep them engaged. I do a whole climate presentation about pets. Um, it's really about the impacts of climate change and what we can do, but I string it together with people thinking and talking about their pets, and I go back and forth, and that keeps people engaged. I want to respect our time. I want to thank the folks who have been watching online. Um, I want to respect your time. It is lunchtime. But if you have questions or anything, come free and see me and all. I do believe in the power of stories. Uh, I believe that stories have an important role to play in the formation of human beings that they can stimulate, amaze, and inspire their listeners, says Hayao Miyazaki. So thank you. Um,
Thank you so much. Thanks to the tech crew as well. Thanks to Ricky Braddy, Bradley.